of you here in New York and also to those of you who are watching on live stream, thank you so much for being here. Before we do anything else, please introduce yourselves to the people around you, to your right and to your left and in front of you and behind you. Tonight we will be celebrating the life and honoring the memory of Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, we have two musical presentations that are part of this. And the first one was gifted to us by Marble Collegiate, our hosts here. Please join with me in welcoming Shamira Mighty. so much. Yeah, too bad you can't sing. That was just magnificent, Shamira, and we know who was looking down on that. Extremely happy and honored. So magnificent, thank you. All right, please join with me. Let's all take a deep breath. <sighs> <clears throat> We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. We watch this light as it begins to grow, larger and larger, until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. We see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. 
We see that the inside of the temple is lit by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are. For we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. And it is to him that we devote our time together and our relationships to one another. And we pray that his most Holy Spirit be upon us. And may we thus be lifted above and beyond the sorrows and the limitations and the fears of this world to the endless love and peace that lay beyond. And so it is together we all say amen. Yesterday was officially the holiday, Martin Luther King's birthday. Uh, for those of you who are too young to remember, the um, official holiday, which was signed into law in 1983, uh, took several years to pass. It wasn't something that happened quickly. It wasn't something that happened easily. Coretta Scott King was pivotal. If Mrs. King had not been so active and uh, persevering as she was, it would not have occurred. It was first introduced in 1979, and certain states, certain representatives kept voting against it. And they just kept on, they kept on. I remember uh, Stevie Wonder was very much a part of the effort. They kept doing these uh, concerts. John Conyers, who uh, recently left Congress, was very active. John Lewis, I mean, it was a real, it was quite a process. And then when it had been turned down in Congress, and some of you, I'm sure, know the song, um, Stevie Wonders, happy birthday to ya. That was uh, for Dr. King. And then there were enough signatures, and finally it was passed into law. I remember at the time myself wondering why his birthday being celebrated was of itself such a big deal. But I think in the years past, it's since then, it's very obvious why making his birthday a holiday is such a big deal. Because it's one day of the year that we all stop to think about him, to think about what he stood for. But also, it's very easy, particularly once people have died, once years have gone by, to start revising history. And so I think that it, it serves us and serves the country, and I think serves the memory of Dr. King that we be as deep in our appreciation of what all that was about uh, as we might be. I know every day uh, when it's Dr. King's birthday, and today was no exception, there are a lot of ways in which people commemorate his life and his service. And one of the things that you hear about a lot, I've heard a lot about this in the last few years, and today was no exception, people quote unquote doing service. People working with the homeless or people working with poverty organizations or something. Sounds good, right? It is almost an insult. Because Dr. King was about something much more inconvenient to the system than just helping the poor on any given day. The status quo does not care if on any given day you help the poor. What Dr. King was about was challenging the underlying forces that make all that poverty inevitable. And that's extremely important, I think, that we remember that. To have a day that people just go work on a food line or do some individual act of service and then the White House has a proclamation is part of the whitewashing, a part of the revisionism of history that those of us who care deeply about these issues want to make sure that we avoid. So, you know, there are many, there's a book called Testament of Hope, and Testament of Hope is the collected writings and speeches of Dr. King. It's meant a lot to me for many, many years, and it's one of those books that you can just open up anywhere. You open up anywhere and you learn so much. Of course, his eloquence, uh, he was a philosopher and he was a, a deep a political thinker, spiritual thinker. You can pick up the book anywhere, but the one obviously, uh, piece of his writing that is considered, and I think should be considered, really one of the most, one of the literary masterpieces in a way of the 20th century was his letter from the Birmingham jail. And you probably have heard it read uh, before. I think that uh, 
it, uh, it, it can never get old because there is so much there that not only teaches us about his time and his conditions, but also teaches us about ours. You know, Dr. King was only 39 years old when he died. Bobby Kennedy was only 43. JFK was 44. John Lennon was 40. So many times when these geniuses among us die, and they die so young, part of the tragedy is what we will never have experienced. We will never, the gifts that we will never receive from them because they were taken from us so young. And for those of us who lived through that time, part of what makes, you know, I often say at these times that usually when someone that you love dies, every year it gets easier. But with the passing of the Dr. King, Bobby Kennedy, and others, it just gets worse. Because everything we feared would happen has happened. And yet, now, Dr. King would be, had he lived, 89 years old. So for many years, it was about our having to somehow try to compensate for the life force that was not among us, thinking in terms of what it might have meant. But now, even had he lived, he would be earning a well-deserved rest. And I think it is important for all of us to remember that this is not then, this is now. And generations come and generations go. We all remember Dr. King for having had a dream. But I think we miss a greater point of his life if we only think in terms of the fact he had a dream. It's not enough to dream. It's what he did. It was not just Dr. King's dream that we want to remember on a day like today. It was Dr. King's courage. It was not just what he dreamed. It was what he did to make that dream a reality, not only for his children, but for millions of children considering today. E continuing even today. So before I read from this abridged version of the uh, letter from a Birmingham jail, let's just go over a little bit of the history. There were marches in Birmingham and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, of which he was the head, and that was centered in Atlanta, but there were many affiliates, there were 85 affiliates. They had come in and they were part of the march. And during that march, Dr. King was jailed. Now, first of all, let's, let's just remember this. He's writing this from a jail, okay? He's writing this letter as a black man in a Birmingham jail during segregation. And when you watch documentaries, you read about, you know, Bobby Kennedy on the phone, you bastards better not touch him. Nobody knew what was gonna happen. So anything that you might think of in terms of dangers today, a black man might experience or anyone might experience in jail, think that, Dr. King being in a Birmingham jail, right, in 1963. They had been jailed because the march was considered illegal. Now there was a letter that was put out and there were I think nine clergy people. And these clergy people said in this public letter, you know, we appreciate what this movement stands for, but this march was illegal. And you must work within the system. And you must work uh, according to the laws. And you must negotiate. We do not approve of the means that you were using of civil disobedience because the march had been declared illegal. Are you with me so far? So this is the letter that Dr. King wrote. Many of the quotes, you know, basically my point here is that, you know, we all put Dr. King memes on Instagram on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we want to be careful here. And a lot of the quotes that are on these memes that are so famous do come from the letter uh, from a Birmingham jail. Some of his most qu famous quotes are in here. But we want to remember the historical circumstances that make it so potent, including the dangers that were faced by the people who were resisting 
uh, segregation at that time, and even the specific dangers that were being faced by Dr. King specifically, um, or at least theoretically, while he was in that jail. He was writing this letter in response to the letter that had been made public from the clergyman saying that they did not support the illegal means by which they were resisting segregation. <clears throat> My dear fellow clergyman, this was written on April 16th, 1963. Now, let's put this a little bit in context, too. So he died in 1968. He was 39. This was 1963. He's 34 years old. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities, quote, unwise and untimely, unquote. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give you the reason for my being in Birmingham since you have been influenced by the argument of quote unquote outsiders coming in. And then he goes on to talk about how the Southern Christian Leadership Conference has an organization that is headquartered in, in Atlanta, but it has 85 affiliate, um, uh, affiliate organizations. The local affiliate in Birmingham had invited them to come to Birmingham to engage in nonviolent direct action, if that was deemed necessary, he said we readily consented. He says, but more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Now, this is the beginning of one of the main principles of Dr. King, a quote that, that I'm going to say in a couple of sentences that we all know. But this idea that it's not enough for you to respond to injustice only if it's in your neighborhood. He says, moreover, I'm cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. One, collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. That's very important. Number two, negotiation. Number three, self-purification. And number four, direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of the country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notorious reality. There had been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of these conditions, <clears throat> Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiating sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as the promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. 
On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a moratorium on any type of demonstrations. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs remained. As in so many experiences in the past, we were confronted with blasted hopes and the dark shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. So we had no alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. We were not unmindful of the difficulties involved. So we decided to go through the process of purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and repeatedly asked ourselves the questions, are you able to accept the blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? Now, what we're going to be talking about here tonight is the idea of courage. Nobody got to sit behind their computer screen and just sign a petition, put a meme on Instagram. They sent dogs after these people, fire hoses. So the whole point of nonviolent action was if they, bring, if they start beating us with batons, will we not retaliate? He goes on, he says, you may well ask, what direct action? Why, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, etc.? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without legal and nonviolent pressure. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups, this is once again one of the most famous of the lines, just as that paragraph about mutuality and the network of mutuality and interrelatedness that I already read is one of the most famous pieces, that injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. This is another one of the most famous and I think eternally potent uh, messages of the letter from Birmingham jail. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and give up their unjust posture, but as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups are more immoral than individuals. Now that's, that's a big deal. Dr. King said repeatedly that the US Congress was less compassionate than the American people. And that's why when you talk about something like just working in a bread line today, nobody's questioning the decency of individuals. The issue of Dr. King is not about individual transformation. It is about challenging the social and economic and political forces which hold people down. And that, if, you, if we miss that, then not only are we missing the whole point of why we honor Dr. King, but I think we're missing something very important for our day. He says, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. You know, that's another thing. You know, he was a very controversial character during his time. And he's being now seen as this kind of like this sort of through soft light. That was radical then and it's radical now. We know through painful experience that, never, that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I've never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed because that's what everybody was saying to him, your timing's not good. This is the incrementalist argument. Just take little baby steps. But Dr. King said, if you take little baby steps, then what happens is that the system will co-opt everything that you're about, and you'll find that you're not really moving forward. The system is just talking different, right? Like when you hear all these oil and gas companies talk about how environmentally correct they are and everything they're doing for the environment, 
and that some of them are in some ways, don't get me wrong, but in general, that's not what's going on here. It's that the language of environmentalism has been co-opted by some of the worst perpetrators against environmental justice. It must be demanded. Frankly, I've never yet engaged, he says, in a direct action movement that was well-timed, according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. It has been a tranquilizing thalidomide relieving the emotional stress for a moment, only to give birth to an ill-formed instant of frustration. Infant of frustration. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence, and we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has been advertised on television, and see the tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children, and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking in agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white men and colored, when your first name becomes nigger and your middle, middle name becomes boy, however old you are and your last name becomes John, and when your wife and mother are never given the respected title of Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in the public schools, at first, at first glance it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying the others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the brat to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility 
to disobey unjust laws. I would agree that with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. What is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and awful. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as would the rabid segregationists. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, there's nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice who prefers a negative peace which is in the absence of tension to a positive peace which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. In spite of my shattered dreams of the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership in the community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern serve as the channel through which our just grievances could get to the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand, but again, I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law, but I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this decree because integration is morally right 
and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard so many ministers say, the, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which made a strange distinction between body and soul, the sacred and the secular. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all of their scintillating beauty. Use for the cause of peace, yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. You know. As Gail and I have discussed, um, Norman Vincent Peale, who was the minister here at this church and who did give us so much in terms of positive thinking, et cetera, was actually one of those white ministers who uh, was resistant to, um, uh, to the cause of, of, of integration and very much, uh, you know, it's important that we face these things and know uh, some of these things as they occurred. Once again, it was his mix of philosophy and personal courage that gives a letter like that such moral authority. And like I said, for us to just say, oh, it's Martin Luther King Day and not deal with so much of what is going on today is, I believe, to do a disservice to the memory. In 1965, that letter was written in 1963. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson did sign the Voting Rights Act. And the Voting Rights Act was one of the primary uh, essential core pieces of the civil rights movement. Because what happened after the Civil War is that in, particularly in nine southern states, they would say to black people, okay, well, of course you can vote. I tell you what you do, stand on your left foot and uh, read the Constitution backwards by memory, and then you can vote. Those were the kinds of things that they did to deny people uh, the right to vote. In 1965, with 19, uh, the Voting Rights Act was passed, and guess what happened in 2015, ladies and gentlemen? In 2015, our Supreme Court started chipping away at the Voting Rights Act. And it was a very contentious decision, once again, five to four. For any of you who thought that voting for president on the basis of who was going to get in the Supreme Court was beneath you, this is why this stuff matters. And so in, 19, in, in 2015, with John Robert, Roberts, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, they took away pieces of the, of the uh, Voting Rights Act. And John Roberts, who wrote the main decision, said, well, we have to go with the circumstances that are true today. We don't have those problems today. And uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her very vigorous dissent said, no, we don't have first generation barriers, we have second generation barriers. And big surprise, they're back. And this is what gerrymandering, et cetera, are. As soon as that decision was passed, states all over the place started coming up with things, with plans that had been outlawed by the Voting Rights Act. So this is so extremely important, ladies and gentlemen, because when we know history, we recognize certain elements that if we aren't, uh, which will always return if we are not vigilant in their replacement. You know, any addict knows you, you don't get to say, okay, if you're, if you're really an addict and you're not going to drink anymore or you're not going to take drugs anymore or you're not going to overeat anymore immoderately, whatever that is, you can't just say, I'm not going to do that anymore. You have to commit to your sobriety. So what's happened in America is in so many ways we naively, and it was so easy to distract us, you know, we're all so distracted. We thought these things were handled. 
Oh yeah, the Civil Rights Act, so these things were handled. There was, there was the abolition of slavery, and there was the Civil Rights, Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Movement, and that, of course, is just one piece of the larger issues of democracy and the assault on democracy. Democracy is, in fact, a relationship that you have to tend, just like you have a marriage or a love affair or a relationship with anyone in your life. You can't take people for granted, and you can't take freedom for granted, and you can't take democracy for granted. So when it comes, of course, to the issues of race in America, and, I, and I'm not saying some good things have not occurred. I'm not saying improvements have not been made, and I think that it's showing a, a dishonor not only to Martin Luther King, but to all of our ancestors to fail to recognize the improvements that have, have occurred. I remember when I was a little girl, because I grew up in Houston, and I remember at, at the medical uh, Towers building, which is still there in Houston, where we would go to the doctor. I remember asking my mother why there was a sign between the elevators that said colored bathrooms downstairs. I mean, I, I remember that in my lifetime. So there are many things that, that certainly have improved, but there are many ways in which a moral dysfunction is like a physical disease. If you don't cut it out at its at its cause, it just morphs into another symptom. And so now with things like the voting suppression, so uh, uh, the president tried that, you know, with the voting fraud commission when there's like practically zero evidence of voting fraud. So we all know what that was about. But now they're still working on that voter suppression, voter fraud thing. This is extremely important. This is as important as our time, as these issues were as important in Martin Luther King's time. And uh, there's a gentleman named Ari Berman that I highly recommend that you read and be aware of his work because voter suppression is the new, new attack. Of course, if you start suppressing votes, there are so many ways that these things are, that these things just morph into different symptoms. But once again, even though some of the actual circumstances are different, obviously we no longer have institutionalized segregation but then what would dr king say about mass incarceration and so forth what would he say about many of the circumstances we have but once again he would be 89 years old dr king even if he were alive he had he, he would have earned the right to rest the issue is on us now and if all we're doing on martin luther king day is going rah 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 and how wonderful and you know, do an act of service, then once again, we're missing the point. You know, ever since we have the undue influence of money that we have on our political system, we have these two major political parties, and one doesn't even pretend it's not acting at the behest of the corporate forces whose money can override gen genuine advocacy for the American people. But too many times that other party wrings its hands and understands your pain and does what it does on the periphery to ameliorate the pain, but still does not address those underlying forces that make all that pain inevitable. That was Dr. King. It's not enough to just write those beautiful words. He didn't just write those beautiful words. He wrote them from jail. And today, you know, I remember the death of Martin Luther King. I remember the death of Bobby Kennedy. And most importantly, I remember the deaths of those students at Kent State. Because to have lived at a time, even though I was young, and you know, when you're young, when you're, you know, you, 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 you feel these things. Like when you're a teenager, look how, how mature these kids are. Those of us who have kids who are 11 and 12, they know what's going on. And to have people in our midst like Dr. King and like Bobby Kennedy who, who spoke these philosophical dreams in actual political action, that's what we had. We had people who were laying it down philosophically, spiritually, morally within the larger political structure. But when those people were shot and killed in front of our eyes, there was a very loud unspoken message that went out to everyone. And it didn't need to be articulated verbally, it was clear. And that was that we would now leave the public sector alone, leave it to whoever it is that wants it so bad that clearly they're willing to kill in order to control it. You can do whatever you want in the private sector, but leave the public sector alone. And they didn't have to say it, the message was clear or we might kill you too. And that is what has happened to us. We put our energy, we put our genius, 
we put our talents in the private sector. You can make your dreams come true, you can, you can have a successful business, and you can make money, and you can get the love that you want. This is not liberation, this is complete co-opting. And so what's happened in the last year is that people are like, whoa, <laughs> what's happened? Because we took our eye off that ball because we were told to. And we did as we were told. And now it's, I think, already an activation in our generation. And by generation, I mean all of us who are adults at this time, to recognize that it's not enough just for you to be able to have you know, your particular kingdom. You know, I remember when my first book came out and I, because of Oprah Winfrey, was very fortunate when that book came out and I did what a lot of people in America do when you have a book come out that sells out well, you buy a house in Santa Barbara. <laughs> <clears throat> and one day, with great sadness now for what Santa Barbara and Montecito has been going through, but I remember one of the first days that I was sitting in my new house on my beautiful couch, on my beautiful rug, looking out my beautiful window at my beautiful swimming pool. And I could almost hear my father's voice, the bastards got to you, didn't they? And that's exactly what success in America had given me, the ability to escape. The ability, I think by going to Detroit, I overreacted. <laughs> Didn't have to go that far. <laughs> but I know where my heart was and why. And that's really what America has become. That at the highest level of making it, you're able to escape it. You're able to live in a place where it's, you're not looking at it. I remember once when I lived in Santa Barbara and I picked up the newspaper one day and I saw a, a law that had been passed that you couldn't sit on the sidewalk. And I couldn't understand, why would they pass a law that you can't sit on the sidewalk? And my friend said to me, Mary Ann, be real. It's because homeless people are inconvenient to see. So if you pass a law that you can't sit on the sidewalk, who is mainly going to be sitting on the sidewalk? Homeless people. And that's what the system does. Americans are decent people. Martin Luther King was always pointing that out. As individuals, we're decent. So you make the suffering, you make sure it's on the other side of town. Or you make sure it's on the other side of the world. And then it's very, very easy to put your blinders on. Well, that only works so long, doesn't it? And for that matter, there is no amount of money that anybody can make that can protect us or our children from the devastating consequences that will occur if we don't put the, the real forces of democracy back on track in the ways that many of us know they need to be put back on track right now. So I think that on a day like today, when we are remembering Dr. King, let us refuse to be co-opted by the whitewashed version. And I don't mean that from any kind of color pun. I mean it just from the sense of how we revise history and make it all soft and sweet. Those famous words in the letter from a Birmingham jail, where he spoke of the actual conditions that people were living in. It is important for us to remember that even though great strides have been made in certain ways, we still have some serious issues of economic and social and political injustice in our country. It's not like everything's been fixed. And even when certain things are quote unquote fixed, they can be removed, they can be chipped at. We not only have that, that uh, voting rights uh, limitation on the Voting Rights Act by the Supreme Court in 2015, we have things that are occurring with the current Department of Justice right now. And for me, in the work that I do, one of the reasons why Martin Luther King matters so much is because this idea of people in positions of spiritual and religious leadership sitting on the sidelines, it's such a condemnation, it was such a condemnation by Dr. King of those who would sit on the sidelines. And he pointed out there, and I as a Jew had been very aware of it, you know, those who just stood there while the Jews were being taken in cattle cars and didn't say anything, and all the ministers who stood there and didn't say anything. All the ministers who 
didn't talk about didn't talk about slavery in any other terms than well it's the law so it's okay you look at many people today in america who actually will will support at least tacitly indirectly if not directly laws that perhaps we ourselves would find unjust saying that the gospel does not need does not deal with collective behavior and we in the transformational community in the higher consciousness community have come up with our own ways to escape any sense of real moral responsibility you know all this stuff that that too often you see about how spirituality is where the real causal change occurs but politics is not where it's at nobody is saying i don't think dr king was saying that politics is the vessel of of salvation but he was saying and i think any of us who actually look will agree it's not the vessel of salvation but if we are not careful it will be the vessel of our destruction i was just reading today that the government has now passed a plan 1 trillion dollars over the next 30 years to build more nuclear bombs we already have 7000 i think just in our country alone and when they did the false when they did the false uh, alarm the other day in hawaii i loved it they said go inside the basement that's going to work the building will be incinerated let's be very clear or go to the side of the road well that that'll really help i mean they there are so many ways in which it's not fun today to look at what's really going on in our world any more than it was but to me the point is we have to more than dream we have to more than visualize and as you've heard me say before can't wait for your trauma work to be over before you show up here country they were traumatized you think he wasn't traumatized in that in that jail cell you think those people walking across the bridge in selma weren't traumatized we are we are going once again to this amusing ourselves to death our courage the musculature of courage will wither away if we don't use it now what does that mean you're supposed to do i have no idea the course in miracles is very clear about that each and every one of us are given guidance by the holy spirit our own guidance as to what to do but i know one of the things that we are not to do i have never seen any religious or spiritual path that i've ever read about or heard about or studied that gives any of us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings so do all kind if you if you if we are living our lives and we are only concerned about manifesting our own dreams call it whatever you want to call it but don't call it spiritual because there's nothing spiritual about looking away convenient though it might be from the suffering of other people whether those people are in this country or whether those people are in in other countries that inescapable network of mutuality that Dr King spoke of in the letter to Birmingham jail is as true today as it was true then if anything it is even more true Dr King said we're all on the same boat and if there's a hole on the boat anywhere we're all going down and when you know things happen like the other day the false alarm that in fact the bombs were not coming from north korea too bad it wasn't a false alarm when our bombs were coming to baghdad to rain on people who had done nothing to hurt us who had nothing to do with 911 who even though he killed some of his own people china's killed people in tibet who even if he had had weapons of mass destruction we do business with countries that have weapons of mass destruction all the time we acquiesce to that we we put up a an argument but we didn't put up anywhere near the acts of civil disobedience and what the hell are we doing that might have saved millions of lives so i think that we are living in as a time which is as potent and significant not just for our country but for the world as dr king was in his time we dream we might not be as articulate as he was we might not be as brilliant as he was but that's not even what's lacking we don't have to ask ourselves am i as brilliant as dr king we don't have to ask ourselves am i as articulate as dr king but we do have to ask ourselves do i have an ounce of the courage that dr king had enough with the brand protection enough with wanting applause enough with wanting particularly among women you know you, you can't you can't be a part of a prophetic voice and be a people pleaser at the same time and this is not the time of the soloist 
And if anything, the 60s taught us, if a, if a political revolutionary era is ushered in, led by soloists, they can shoot the soloists. That's not the zeitgeist of this moment, because they can't shoot a song. This is about all of us. This is not just about brilliant leaders like Dr. King. This is about the brilliant leader in all of us, as we follow the brilliant leader in our hearts. We follow the brilliant leader in our hearts and do what we are led to do. I think if anything, for me, the message of Dr. King Day is, dear God, let me not sit this out. Before we do our meditation, we are going to hear from one of our friends and companions who we hear, I think I see you every week, Dawn, who definitely did not sit this out. You know, Shamira, how old was, is Shamira? She's 19 years old. Pardon? Just graduated, from high Just graduated from high school. And it's so beautiful, and it's so beautiful what she has in her cells. And we are happy for her, of course, that she does not have in her in her actual visceral memory, although I'm sure she has it in her cellular memory, the things of which she so passionately sang. But Don McGrath has a history with Martin Luther King, an actual history with Martin. In 1963, he led a group of college students in Pittsburgh to the March on Washington. The I Have a Dream speech simply lifted us, lifted us off the ground to our feet, he says, never to be forgotten for a moment. In 1965, I traveled with students of the North to join the Selma Montgomery March. While we were demonstrating outside the office that was not giving us the final parade permit to bring the march right up to the Capitol, there was a raging rainstorm. Almost everyone deserted the lines and ran. I found myself in this raging storm now in the front line. As I turned my head, I discovered I was shoulder to shoulder with Martin. We smiled at each other. A couple of hours went by and we departed. The next day, with the leaders of SNCC, we decided to go to the Capitol to demonstrate in front of Governor George Wallace, who was the premier segregationist governor, Alabama, right? Uh, that they were being unfair. There is a Life magazine cover of the Capitol completely surrounded by state police. We sat down on the ground and the city police threw us into paddy wagons and off to Montgomery Jail. After a seven-day hunger strike, we were released. In 2005, 40 years later, I returned to Montgomery for the dedication of, of the Wall of Tolerance at the Southern Poverty Law Center. At the request of Morris Dees, the most courageous man in America, I sang Abraham, Martin, and John. And in 2015, Congress awarded us a Congressional Medal to the foot soldiers for justice, Selma to Montgomery marches 1965. I sang on Broadway in the 1970s, he said, but singing that song fills me with a beautiful memory of those wonderful men who gave their lives as they tried to make a better life for me and you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was written by our friend, my friend and yours, John McGrath, Don McGrath, and he's going to sing that song for us here tonight. You're going to hold it, or? John, okay, yeah. come on over. You're going to hold it for it. Great. Testing. Hi, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> Martin, this is for you. Has anybody here seen my old friend Abraham? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people, but it seems the good die young. 
And I just turned around and he's gone. Anybody here seen my old friend John? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people, but it seems the good die young. And I just turned around and he's gone. Anybody here seen my old friend Martin? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people, but it seems the good die young. And I just turned around, and he's gone. Didn't you love the things they stood for? Didn't they try to make a better life for you? For me, and will be free someday soon. It's gonna be. Has anybody here seen my old friend Bobby? Can you tell me where he's gone? I think I see him coming up over the hill. With Abraham Martin and John. John McGrath. Thank you. John McGrath. Thank you very much. Congressional Medal of Honor winner. <laughs> thank you, Don. And thank you not only for this, but thank you for what you have stood for and continue to mean to all of us. I think if anything, we realize just living our lives, whether it's in the life of an individual or the life of a nation, life is not just one moment of time. And life doesn't always go in a straight line from this good thing to that good thing to the next best thing. And America has is a magnificent storyline of this dichotomy between the highest aspirations and constitutionally given freedoms and the fact that many times we have perpetrated transgression against the very freedoms on which we purport to stand. But every generation, every generation lives that contest. Ours no less than any other. But there have been those. You know, sometimes I think these days it's so easy to be so angry about the things that America's done wrong that we dishonor our own ancestors by failing to remember that even though we had terrible things in this country, we also had people who ended those terrible things. We had slavery, but then we had abolition. Women did not have the right to vote or own property, but then we had suffrage. There was institutionalized uh, white supremacy and segregation, but then we had the civil rights movement. This is not the first generation of Americans who's lived at a time of some serious stress on our democratic freedoms and institutions. Let's just make sure we're not the first generation to wimp out on the job doing what it will take to put America back on track. We were a country that had slavery, but we also had a, were a country that had abolition. So let's not just identify the problems, let's identify with the, those who solved those problems. We know what Martin Luther King did in his time. We know what other great heroes have done in their times. We must be a heroic generation. Not just you, not just you, not just me. This is not about the heroic individual, not the moment that we're living in. This is about the rising up of a generation. When we look at World War II, certainly there were people like Franklin Roosevelt who were certainly leaders, but they talk about the generation that fought World War II. So I think this, on this, this particular year, Martin Luther King's birthday, 
has particular relevance and significance as well as poignancy, not just for particular issues of, 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 of race, not just for particular issues of, of racial injustice, because Dr. King, he, he emerged obviously from black America, and he was addressing issues of black America, but it is a historical um, uh, um, opinion which I, I agree with myself. Many feel that Dr. King would not have died if he had kept his conversation only to race. It was when he started talking about the Vietnam War, increased militarism, and so forth, that the system had had enough. So whatever that means to you, I don't know. That's, this is where we go into that sacred place within. For some of us, it's an internal thing. Don't be such a coward. Don't keep your mouth shut. You know, Dr. King says, said your life begins to end on the day you stop talking about things that matter most. And he said that it's always the right time to do the right thing. So in all of our lives, and usually I know for me it's, it's both and, it's things I have to change on the inside and things I have to change on the outside. Dr. King said we need a quantitative shift in our circumstances and a qualitative shift in our souls. So when we go into this place and you hear the voice for God speaking to you, you'll know. Where is it that the little tweaking, where is God asking you to tweak things a little? Is it in your personality or is it in your behavior? Probably if you're like, like most of us, it's a little bit of both. But we've talked about this before. When you're in a room like this, when we've had the kind of conversation we're having here tonight, when you are praying with people the way we're praying together tonight, whatever you find yourself saying to yourself, listen to yourself, because that's the voice for God. Let's pray. On this night, in honor of Martin Luther King and all those who in their time and in their way have lived into a prophetic vision, on this night, let us lean into ours. On this night, let us remember that he and other prophets New fear as we know fear. New disappointment as we know disappointment. New painful struggle and criticism and negativity and even dangers hurled at him and his family. And yet, he persevered. On this night, let us bear witness to the courage that others have shown, to the brilliance that has risen up in others, to the love for all humanity that has guided others. And let us remember that we too can be courageous. We too carry the potential for brilliance and we too have a deep love for mankind. On this night in honor of Martin Luther King, let us lay down our weakness. On this night in honor of Martin Luther King, let us lay down our self-centeredness. On this night, in honor of Martin Luther King, let us too rise above our small-minded concerns and rise to the occasion that in our time we might, as he did in his, be guided by the Spirit of God to be and to do as God would have us be and do. We pray for the soul of Martin Luther King. We pray for the soul of his wife, Coretta, his daughter, Yolanda. We pray for those who walked with him 
and in many cases suffered with him, and in some cases died for the same cause. Let us do more than remember. Let us be transformed. Dear God, we are so tired of living small lives. We are so bored with ourselves. Let us too carry the mantle of significance and import that in our day as in his day, we might look at the forces of injustice and stare them down. That we might stand before the forces that would dismantle democracy and stare them down. That we might gaze into the eyes of darkness and bring forth with us such light that darkness itself shall dissolve. Thank you, dear God, for the lives and the demonstration of Dr. Martin Luther King and others who showed us what it looks like, who gave us the words, explained to us the principles, and embodied them with such strength and courage that the path before us is paved with light should we choose to walk it. We too shall be surrounded by angels. We too shall have cosmic companions on our way, one of whom shall be the eternal spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, who on this day and every day resides with the council of great souls who have guided humanity from our earliest beginnings. Where he is now, may he be at peace. And may his peace in heaven be deepened by knowing on this night we heard what he said, and we too will do our best. May we be guided. May the voice for God whisper in your ear. May the presence of God illumine your path. And may the power of God give you the strength to walk it. Dear God, make us the men and women that you would have us be, that we might do as you would have us do, henceforth and forever. And so it is. Amen.